Welcome everyone to EduTech 2020 International Congress and Expo. Today you have joined the impact of COVID-19 on student success roundtable sponsored by Canvas. Just to give you a bit of an idea about how roundtables work, roundtables are in-depth discussions focused on a particular topic, and this one's directed by your host, Chris Bradman. He will guide the conversation and facilitate the questions and answers from you as a participant. Please try to participate as much as you can, swap war stories, ask questions, gain a better understanding, and then you can go back and put it all to practice in your organization, school, department, or agency. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sabra, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, or for, uh, for our friends, uh, any friends in uh, Asia who's joining us, uh, still good morning, I think, just there. So uh, welcome to... Uh, Welcome to our session this afternoon. We obviously only have uh, 30 minutes for, for, um, for this round table, which um, I think based on the amount of people who have registered is, uh, is, is it's going to be a case of uh, whoever puts their hands up first will uh, we'll get to comment, I think. But uh, I'm looking forward to a, a good conversation. OK, so, um, yes, yeah, so my name is Chris Bradman. I am the uh, general manager for Instructure. And of course, you would know Instructure as the uh, provider of, uh, of Canvas, our, our leading uh, uh, learning management uh, platform. So um, I'm here today really to uh, initiate a conversation really around the impact of COVID-19 on student success. So um, earlier on in the year, that uh, it seems like a long time ago, but it was actually just back in June, uh, we conducted a, um, a survey of uh, just over 7,000 respondents, and it was a worldwide survey. And it was um, uh, we partnered with Hanover Research for this, um, who went uh, out to a number of institutions and our students and educators on their views on a few key uh, topics. And one of those was the impact of, of, of COVID-19. So obviously we have all been impacted one way or the other by COVID-19 this year and um, and will continue to be uh, in 2021. So just to give you a little, a few sort of stats on the background of the study, uh, it covered 13 countries, as I said, uh, over 7,000 respondents. Uh, it, you know, to bring this down to an Australia level, you know, we, we uh, looked over 550 students administrators uh, in Australia. Uh, so that's um, the basis of the research today. So let's just uh, move it forward to the, uh, the first slide here. We can uh, kick off the first uh, point that I'd like to discuss. OK, so it is a, a very simple uh, question around, um, you know, the, what is the impact and, and how is that uh, impacting things such as academic pro uh, progress, work readiness? Um, as you can see, there was a number of 67% uh, of, of students felt that they were falling behind uh, as a result of COVID-19. And I think for us, um, you know, one of the things that we looked at was, uh, you know, how engaged students are during uh, compared to being uh, more in the in the classroom uh, and, and the lecture hall. So um, I just wanted to kick this off as perhaps an initial uh, uh, couple of people would like to put their hand up or respond. Um, really just to understand, you know, from from your perspective of being within the institutes, you know, how easy or difficult has it been to maintain student engagement during online and, and remote learning? And, um, and Patrick, I'm going to come to you if that's OK. Patrick Stoddart, um, uh, obviously very familiar with, with yourself and your institution and uh, very pleased you can join us here today. So um, Patrick, keen to get your view if you, if you, you would help sort of share with, if, with the crew uh, your impressions of COVID-19 and how it has impacted student engagement. Um, sure. Um, so I, I guess just uh, really quickly, um, uh, COVID, you know, um, we initially tried the move online in March to handle uh, the international student restrictions. And of course, very quickly, that was for everyone. I think the, the main, uh, and sort of like it was COVID, it was a more emergency shift. And I think now we're all seeing we're trying to move from that emergency shift to proper online learning, delivery and design. Um, but I do think one of the telltales for us that we want to address is, and this is sort of more anecdotal, but it did come through some of our surveys, was the students were expressing it was a lot harder to actually do the same level of study. So traditionally, of course, universities, most students, most full time students are undertaking four subjects or four courses per semester. And I think we, we did see a lot of students were struggling with that kind of study load now that it had moved fully online. So I think there's some interesting things to unpack there as to what were the additional difficulties or expense or 
uh, concentration points that were needed by the students to try and maintain their study load. Uh, so I think that was that was a big takeout for us. Um, the other one was um, shifting modalities to a lot more uh, asynchronous use uh, helped a lot as well. So uh, we tried to steer people away from using Zoom and Teams unless the pedagogy actually needed an active collaborative engagement and tried to move to more short and away from one and two hour lectures, of course, towards more short order topical video. So we actually have seen some what would have been called pre-COVID class flipping flip into the class um, to those kind of efforts. And those were welcomed very much by the students. So I think it's it's very much still trying to unpack and explore some of our emergency efforts and translate those into better learning design as we move forward into we were already we were already a hybrid institution, but of course now it's going to be much more hybrid than was, you know, we sort of leaped five to eight years uh, in many ways as to what the what that metric, what that balance was going to be. So there's very much now the call to do proper quality learning design and look at our our online activities and how to do labs and activities better online so that we can actually support fully online students with the same education uh, quality as we do our face to face. Mm. Yeah, I think I think you uh, it's an excellent point you, you're making there just in, kind of in terms of the speed of transition. I think that, you know, all of us had to suddenly sort of shift gears into this into this new way of working. I mean, speaking personally, obviously, from just from a from a working front, I mean, I only joined um, Canvas this year and uh, within within two weeks of me being in the office we all cleared out the office so I spent the whole year kind of getting to know my team um, remotely which you know different kind of environment but similar challenges you know you, you just it's difficult to, to you know engage in the same way that would if you're sort of face to face and like I say there was no real time to kind of plan how things would uh, happen it just sort of happened literally overnight so great thank you Patrick. OK, anybody else would like to contribute to uh, to this and, and share their examples and, uh, and experience of uh, what's happened over the last sort of few months? OK, Joanna. Um, hi, um, I'm a lecturer within um, science, so um, Box Hill Institute has a few degrees, including a biosecurity degree, which I teach. What I found this year, um, having to shift online quickly, especially in a science degree, all my subjects have quite a lot of labs that we have to run, microbiology, genetics, and things like that. Um, the overall um, success that I've seen was mainly on the second year and third year students. They, because they already knew us, they already knew the degree, um, they adapted really quickly. Um, they already had enough background that resources that we were sending to them, they were navigating really well. We actually had really good feedback on, um, we moved from doing the lectures the way that we do in person to do uh, recordings and then join. So a little bit of flipped classroom recordings that they had a few days to run through and then bring the discussion in class. And they actually thought that it was really good because um, really dense uh, material like genetics. Um, one of my students is like, it's so good to be able to go back and listen to that sentence three times until I figure out what you're saying and then continue. Um, so that was positive. Um, one of the things that I think we struggled more was first year students, especially students that um, uh, came straight from, from uni or internationals um, and they I think they were excited with the whole um, um, higher education and then suddenly they just got um, put online. Um, we've tried to make really um, clear uh, worksheets for tutorials every week instead of giving too many resources um, together, but there was um, still a little bit of um, lack of interaction with them. One of the things that I've noticed, for example, is some of my brightest students, one of my students that was always HD, um, was really positive in the beginning of the semester and she got halfway through and she asked for extension of an assignment because she says, I, I'm not used to spend all day at the computer. I, I engage and she was a mature student and I engage with a science degree because I want to be in person, I want to be in the lab, I wanted to 
talk, not to be looking at videos and online uh, with two kids at home. She's like, my brain is completely. <laughs> so we had to, um, you know, had a few one-on-one -on -one chats and we moved her to uh, listen to our tutorials outside in the backyard. I wasn't allowing her to be inside. I needed to see the tree so she could get some fresh air. So we tried to engage a little bit of um, but it was it was interesting. I think in, in general, so quickly that we had to do that um, was positive. And as Patrick said, we were already moving to um, partial online for subjects that didn't have laboratory skills to start with. Um, and now we are just you know, forced um, very quickly to do that. Um, so yeah, so I probably talked too much, but that was. No, thank you for your insights. And I, I think, um again a, a point to pick up on there is that we kind of forget that you know where learning happens it's just not about lecturer to student it is student to student that collaboration that we that we kind of that we learn by every day in, in all of our uh, different environments um has, has not been accessible to us so i think that's a that's a very valid point that you raised there okay uh, anybody else like to contribute on this point because before we kind of move on to uh, talk about another couple of points OK, well, let's um, let's pick up on just looking at the slide here. And, uh, you know, we saw that 68% uh, of respondents here felt that, uh, you know, COVID-19 did have an impact on their work and career readiness. And I think, you know, just to kind of dig a little deeper in that, I think what you have seen um, through COVID is, is frankly, the total destruction of, uh, of certain um, certain forms of work right I mean some of these uh, some industries have been very much impacted by uh, by COVID and are going to take a very long time to recover and I think you know the, the, the feeling that um, the respondents we were getting back from the respondents was that um, their uh, you know people were training for certain things and now we're questioning you know um, perhaps um, the direction they were going based on uh, how COVID had impacted some uh, some of the uh, career aspirations that they had. So I think that was an interesting point from that uh, point. Is any, if anybody's got anything to comment on that at all. Okay, right. So let's and let's have a look at um, uh, looking at academic pro uh, progress as well. So in terms of sort of falling behind. Um, in, in studies, you know, this was a bit of a mixed bag. Again, if you look at across Asia Pacific and, and to, you know, to give you an idea, oh, we've just got somebody, uh, just got a bit of background noise there. If, uh, if you are talking, if you could mute, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so just looking at uh, this study from an APAC perspective, um, we did focus on uh, certain markets across Asia Pacific. So uh, Australia, India, Singapore and, and the Philippines were some, some some key markets there and uh, out of all of those markets really you know 82 percent of, uh, of students in the Philippines felt that they were falling behind in their studies and I think you know some of the challenges that we saw there was things such as um, uh, access to access to internet for example um, you know is not a guaranteed thing in some of these countries as well obviously you know from an Australia perspective it's some it's uh, it's not a problem that we have to the same extent, but um, Joanne did mention something there that, that our respondents did come back with was um, uh, just how, you know, not having maybe a dedicated room to study in or natural distractions around the house was impacting uh, students feeling that they were kind of falling behind in their studies as well. So, so again, just kind of wanted to put that out there for, um, for other people to comment on if there was uh, other things that people are seeing here. Or at the same time, Patrick and Joanna, thank you for being <laughs> giving some answers already. Then uh, feel free to share your experiences as well. Well, uh, I think one important thing was the a number of Australian universities actually changed their uh, academic progression rules. They made put them into abeyance and allowed pass fail rather than weighted average marks because there was quite a student concern with the new move forward on what would happen to grade point averages and weighted average marks so i think that was a it was a very welcome change for students um, but i think we still to see what the repercussions are for that for these students as they progress through their degrees and their programs 
Yeah. And this, this study was done in June as well. And I think, you know, probably if we did the study again, we'd probably get some, some different answers here because I'm, I'm sure, you know, when, when uh, universities and, uh, and, and businesses started sort of um, uh, pushing their sort of teams out to work from home, it was in March time. And uh, we probably all felt probably by June, we would actually be back in the offices and, and, and universities as well. And here we are near the end of the year and uh, we're still pretty much in the same situation. So I think, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of uh, changes as well as, as we move forward. Do, do, uh, looking looking ahead there, Patrick, do you see? Um, do you think? What do you see things changing in uh, if you look ahead into twenty twenty one? What are some of the things you think uh, are going to? You mentioned earlier that this is now the new norm, of course. Uh, so how, how is uh, how is your institution prepared for that? Well, I, I think it ties in to that moving the quality learning design for all of us. We were. We were, we were all willing to acknowledge that there was an emergency shift and so we, for instance, in this in this case with academic progress, we allowed some of our rules to um, be a little softer, um, but we can't we can't sustain that and we have to so we have to rapidly move to ensure that the pedagogy and the learning outcomes and our activities and our assessment practices are good enough and of high enough quality to equal what we were doing pre-COVID so that we can actually reinstitute those proper academic progression rules and not just have pass file for the students. I mean, because I think it's very important we have to make we have to make sure that the students impacted by COVID, their degrees and their learning and teaching is just as good as it is for any of our prior cohorts. We have to and that's going to mean having to make up uh, some learning, uh, learning and teaching for these cohorts that couldn't prove it. So having to stack maybe some laboratory stuff or performance, those kind of things into latter years where we can so that those students have over the three years, three, four years, they have the full um, sort of experience that they would have had without COVID. I think that's very important for that cohort as the impacted one. And also we have to very rapidly as I said, shape our quality to make sure any fully online or hybrid models are equal to our prior models again for that to make sure that the students experiences uh, and their learning outcomes are just as strong as they were. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. So just, can I just yeah. add one you know, yeah. thing um, just to follow up on Patrick uh, was saying um, a perfect example is because of my subjects are heavily um, laboratory based. There's some learning outcomes. They're specific on learning techniques that I've um, I've engaged with them through tutorials and videos and animations online, but they've actually never done it in front of me in the lab. So they won't be able to just do it. I won't be able to assess them. So we actually moved some of the practical exams for December after the um, the final exams. So they will have a time to come and do some intensive workshops, work on their skills, and then I can tick those boxes. And other ones that we did, as practice was, practice was saying, we actually moved some of the learning outcomes to a second year um, subject. They will start in February. So I, I'm the same teacher and I know where they are. And I know that by July, if we don't, we're not in another lockdown, I'd be able to tick the box on all of those learning outcomes, but some of them we can't get around with. Um, so as Spectre said, we could get around one time, but it's not sustainable all the time. So it's about putting some sustainable practices in place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I'm sure there's a lot of students um, who are kind of wondering what next year looks like, certainly if they're international students as well. And, uh, you know, we, we we're hearing from a lot of our institutions that there are still a, a big student population that are still out of the country and um, and, and many institutions are uh, at the moment unclear what their, what their 2021 numbers uh, are going to be look like uh, as well. I mean certainly from our uh, our survey you know we were we, we saw that um, of the respondents 76 percent uh, thought that students numbers would decrease in 2021 and I guess that's no surprise but I think what was the, the next sort of layer of that is that um, you know uh, over 30 percent thought that they would actually decline by more than 30 percent and that's obviously a huge um, a, a huge gap for uh, for institutions to uh, to manage in terms of student numbers and of course income so uh, that's that was uh, quite uh, quite revealing that point there 
Okay, so um, if we've got about 10 minutes left here. So I just moved forward to socioeconomic uh, disparities and the impact of engagement. We talked a little bit about this um, uh, earlier when we were talking about, you know, not having a uh, particular space to, to work and that type of thing. Um, and, and, as, and again, as you would expect, um, a lot of these uh, figures do change a fair bit depending on what country you look at uh, and certainly some, some areas um, such as uh, such as the Philippines and India, uh, we saw some some more extreme uh, issues there of uh, socioeconomic disparities really impacting engagement. And it it wasn't just around not having necessarily f- fixed broadband internet or uh, things such as a dedicated room to study. And it o- was also uh, factors such as um, uh, you know people people working as well, and you know the fact that a lot of students do are working as well, and that was impacting you know their work was actually impacting on their studies and, and vice versa, and maybe additional childcare responsibilities they had as well. So uh, again, did you, are you hearing anything from uh, from your student base in terms of some of these things? Is that, is that resonating with you, or are there additional things that you've um, that you've heard that, uh, that that fall into this category? Joanna, do you have any comments on that one as well? Um, I keep coming back to you, you guys, because you've like, you've, I, you've been wonderful and put your cameras on, yep. so you're, you're you're top of mind for me. So th- thank you for that. I know uh, I, I get it. A lot of a lot of us suffer from a bit of uh, Teams or uh, or Zoom fatigue, right? And after about the third hour of uh, on camera, we've sort of had enough. So I totally get it. So, um, <laughs> but uh, but thank you for. Uh, for kind of uh, remaining engaged on that, and, and certainly uh, D uh, D Wardle has, uh, has has put up, uh, and so uh, D. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to put my camera on though. <laughs> That's okay. There's no I'm there's no requirement. So, so I'm, I'm not stressed up. Um, <laughs> so um, I think what we've struggled with. So I work for the higher education section of TAFE New South Wales. And we've found our international students struggling quite a bit. Um, because they're in Australia and they have family overseas. So they're emotionally drained, exhausted and very, very anxious because they, one, can't get back home. Two, they can't come in and socialise. So my campus is Glendale campus and we're not as affected as what um, Sydney um, is because we have five campuses that deliver the same course. Um Transportation in Sydney is, is um, n- normally on um, public transport, so then there's a high density of people that are moving around, and, and we've found that that's been a real issue. Whereas for the Hunter region, yes, we still have students that come um, via uh, transport, public transport, but this whole semester we chose to deliver using Adobe Connect classrooms. Um, and we now have students that are domestic students who want our Adobe classrooms to continue because they travel for two hours from Musselbrook just to come to our classes. And we have Central Coast students that do the same. So they're about one and a half hours away. Um, but our international students need to have face-to-face delivery. So that's been a challenge, um, which our sections, our, our whole um delivery of organisation is is looking at can we review what's required by a CEQA and um, TEXA to continue to teach but not have as much face to face because I know that they're allowed to have 30% delivered through blended but they can't do any more. And I imagine that quite you know if you've got international students then they're more likely to be working on a, obviously a different time zone there as well so you've got that challenge I suppose when you're scheduling classes that you know, some of your international students are you know, are having to do an, an unusual kind of um, day in terms of some of the timing, I suppose. Um, we've only got one student who's delivering off-site, as in like overseas, and she is from the, the Philippines, and her time schedule works in with us that she actually um, starts her classes earlier in the day than what um, happens in Australia. Um, and so that works for her, but yeah, she's she's been less resourced, so she doesn't have access to libraries, she doesn't have access to textbooks. We do have some ebooks, but they're already booked out by everybody else that's been smart enough to jump in early. So it's been really challenging for her, um, and she can't wait to get back to Australia because she sees that we are extremely COVID safe and COVID focused. Because um, back home, it's not as easy I believe so everyone else is um, 
within Australia. So we've only got the one that's off site overseas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dee, for your, your contribution there. Okay, so so Dee has proved that you don't have to have your camera on in order to respond. So uh, anybody would anybody else like to uh, to contribute? We've got, you've got five. Uh, we have five minutes left of the of the session, and um, you know, we have quite a few people on here. So yeah, really would love to hear from uh, uh, from anybody else. If if you, if you have any questions uh, on this topic as well, then uh, would now be the time to. And this, this report, by the way, is uh, is available from our website. So it does cover more areas than just COVID related. And there's there's a lot of data there. So um, and you can also actually pick up a copy from our virtual booth as well at the event today. So uh, if there is anything that uh, uh, further you'd like to, to talk about, then um, then our, our team will be at our virtual booth for the rest of the day. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, Saba has given me uh, our five minute warning. So yeah, I guess um, what we'll start to do now is sort of wrap up. So uh, has anybody else got anything they'd like to sort of share with the group? Uh, any questions from what you've heard about so far? We've really just sort of scratched the surface in terms of the report and uh, and the findings. Um, so there is a lot Chris, more that you can Chris, take Chris, I on. just wanted to mention one thing that I don't think was in the report that we find, you know, and I was wondering if others are finding, is um, it started to, because we do have international students in their country of residence, the country of citizenship, we are finding issues about academic freedom are coming up around activities and assessment. So if you think about it, so uh, hypothetically students in Hong Kong wanting to write about, or their journalism students and issues around, uh, so the assessments are actually arguably technically illegal now in Hong Kong, on certain topics that their domestic uh, their domestic colleagues are actually undertaking. So, or even uh, data exchange for research students um, and particular classes of data are considered restricted by their governments or, um, and not to be shared. So that's actually emerged as a whole new area that we haven't previously had to address. I'm just wondering if that's a, uh, again, I don't think it was in the report and I was just wondering if that's something others are finding. Uh, yeah, that wasn't wasn't in the report, but that, that is a very interesting point. Anybody else? Anybody, has anybody found that at all? Um, yeah, Dee's uh, yeah Dee's commenting on that in the chat as well. So yeah, that does seem to be um, seem to be an issue there certainly. Okay, all right. Well. Um, I think we're, we are uh, basically at time. So, uh, any final questions? I think we've got room for for uh, for us, uh, another uh, question or, or comment. No. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, we'll uh, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for your contributions, um, and uh, I hope you're enjoying the uh, the event. And uh, if you haven't already, please do stop by the Canvas Virtual Brew and um, uh, and meet our team, and uh, and we'll be happy to help you. So uh, thanks very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. That was actually a great conversation. Um, I would like to thank Chris and the team members at Canvas to making this happen. Thank you everyone who joined in and shared their point of view and made this discussion great. Everyone, then again, please remember to go to the Canvas booth. You can actually continue the conversation there when the roundtable ends. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.